Welcome back. Um, you know, of course, normally we, we, we try to have a little bit of a break because we know how much networking is such a, a great component of, of, of being here this weekend. Uh, there'll be a lot of that opportunity certainly throughout the weekend and especially this evening when we go to World of Coke. Uh, and so it's going to be a, a, a lot of that. So we're going to try to make sure we get back on schedule. Um, and this is a, a, a real special uh, uh, panel and forum that I think you're going to really enjoy. Uh, it's a look into the boardroom, and uh, and so I'm going to pass it on to my very good friend who will be the uh, who will be moderating this. Um, he is the uh, senior client partner for Corn Ferry, uh, a friend who I've known for many many years. Um, please give a big welcome to Victor Arias, who will be moderating the panel. Look into the boardroom. Uh, excuse me, and thank you, Sid, for all that you have done for us, Sid. And uh, we're here to keep supporting you, Sid, and, uh, and and making sure that you're successful as well. So thank you all for coming. We have a wonderful panel uh, today, and um, so it, the boardroom is a really special place. And so uh, there's always sort of a balancing act between what a CEO does in a company and his role in the boardroom, or her role in the boardroom, and also what uh, the board members do, and and how they interact with CEOs. So I think this will be very insightful as to how you all do that balancing work, uh, and then keeping, of course, uh, what we're is very uh, we're all passionate about and having balance, uh, Latinos and the diversity in the boardroom. So, uh, but first, I'd like to introduce our panelists, if you will, uh, and I'm going to start to my very left. Uh, with uh, Laisha Ward. And so Laisha um, is just an in incredible person. I mean, if you look at all the things that she's done uh, with Target, uh, she has touched so many lives in the roles that she's had, uh, and particularly as the president of the, uh, of the foundation, whether it's hunger or education or uh, any, talk about any social issue. And, and Target has been there, and it's been, been because of Laisha. Um, and you've, you've, you have her bio, so I'm not even going to read her bio. But she's been at Target uh, since 1991. She started when she was five years old there. Um, uh, um, but she is currently the, uh, the, the chief corporate social responsibility officer, a very important role. Um, she's also been on the board of Denny's uh, since 2010 and was actually there when they hired John Miller, who I'll introduce in a second. Um, family is very important to her, um, whether it's her parents, who she looks up to uh, a lot, or to her abuelita, her grandma, Hattie Mae, um, and, uh, and to her husband, Bill. And uh, very strong values, lots of wisdom in her family. Uh, leadership, very strong. How does she do it? She serves, she serves others. And she asks for help. And that's how you are a true leader, when you, when you have those qualities. She also talks about leading with your head and warming with your heart. So that's something I will take away, because uh, I'm always leading with my head and not usually with my heart. I've got to learn how to do that better. Um, a true, strong American story. And so we're very happy to have Laisha Ward here with us. And then I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our uh, John Miller. I met John Miller, golly, a, a few years back uh, when he was the CEO of Taco Bueno. But here's another uh, great story as well. Um, John had uh, grew up humble beginnings, and I'll ask each of them to share their life stories with you uh, in Kentucky. Um, and he started off with Taco Bueno as a manager only to become the CEO, CEO many years later of Taco Bueno, to come back and actually take that company and, and take it to great heights before he uh, uh, came to Denny's and has been an incredible turnaround story. Uh, in three years, they have tripled, or in four years, they have tripled their stock. And uh, John is just an incredible leader as well. Um, 
he is also Latino by marriage. He's married to a <laughs> wonderful gal from El Paso, Texas, so he knows all about menudo and tacos. So, um, <laughs> the real tacos. I'm sorry, no, not tacos, wait, no. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and John's just an incredible person, and if you, you will get to know some of him, get some insights here, but he's been a very strong supporter of ACED and LCDA for the past five years. So please welcome John Miller. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask each of you all then to, to please talk about uh, your life stories, you know, what your upbringing was like, what uh, you know? What were sort of those influences in your life, and what brought you here? So, I'm going to start with you, Leisha. Okay. Um, when we were sharing our stories initially, one of the things I mentioned to Victor was people often assume that I was born in an urban center and grew up in Chicago because one, I talk about it so passionately, you would think that I was from there. Um, but two, it's often even a stereotype. I actually grew up in a small rural community in Indiana, only 700 people in the town where I grew up and we lived outside of the town. So if there is a suburban area uh, outside of a small rural town, I suppose we lived on it. Dirt roads, um, and in fact, it wasn't paved until I was going off to, to college. And so uh, I think what was interesting about that for me, I was the only uh, student of color in my class from first grade until I graduated from high school. and never had the opportunity to um, have a teacher of color or to be with other students of color until I went off to college. And so it was a huge transition and uh, a challenging experience, but one I think that helped me to be really resilient and learn to be confident, to find a voice, uh, to also, quite frankly, pick up a skill that later became an asset. Because so often when you think about the environments that many of us are working in, we're often the only one, whether you're the only woman, the only Latina, Latino, the only African American, and so on and so on. I had a lot of experience uh, being the only one, and so it became a strength and an asset, quite frankly, uh, once I realized it was something that I could harness and, and use to my advantage. I'm the youngest of three children, the, uh, the bossiest, though, of three, <laughs> <laughs> of three children, and uh, again, parents um, were just extraordinary mentors uh, for me in that while they had not had the opportunity to go to college, uh, they like, uh, my great-great-grandmother saw that as a pathway um, out of poverty and into economic opportunity. And so we were poor. Um, so you often you know, do this great work, uh, certainly in my role as a chief corporate social responsibility officer, we talk about helping low-income families. I was one of those low-income families. And so um, you know, education truly did become a pathway to opportunity for me. And so I'm really quite fortunate that they uh, instilled in me that uh, you know, the means and the circumstances in which I was born were not going to dictate uh, the opportunities uh, that they saw um, for me. And so I'm really, really blessed that I went on to become the first in my family to go to college and graduate. Not the last, but certainly the first. And so it's within that context uh, that I'm before you today, um, having gone from you know, a, a, a family environment where uh, again, the first to go to college to then also be the first to go to graduate school. Um, started out making $7 an hour uh, on the selling floor of a store that my company owned at the time. 24 years later, I'm on the executive committee of Target. And so uh, there's really been a pathway of opportunity uh, throughout my life that I've been really blessed to um, uh, been availed to, due in large part to great mentors and sponsors and supporters who have made it possible for me to even see the world bigger than um, perhaps I'd initially seen for myself. Great story, great story. Thank you, Leisha. John, I know. So in similar and very, very different, um, there's sort of the, some opposite things here, and so it's good to see sort of some really different points of view. Uh, I grew up, I was born in Kentucky. My dad was a military, uh, he joined the military. That was one of the better options for somebody that came from that town. Uh, Chillicothe was a, you know, a, a, a lower income town, working class. The Mead paper mill was the, virtually the whole economy there. And then just north of Chillicothe, heading toward Columbus, was Johns Manville and Alcoa Aluminum and RCA Electric and all of those manufacturing jobs that are all in some other country now, except for the paper mill, which is, which is still there. Actually, Kenworth is still there building trucks, and they're, they're doing quite well. But that economy sort of blew up over the course of when when I was a little kid to today. So it was a very interesting uh, study of you know, how middle America was built 
through large manufacturing and then how it's been compromised over the recent years. Um, and, and, and certainly a story not to be forgotten. But I grew up in the middle of all that. And so you have one of those swing states, one of seven in the United States that can't make up its mind you know, with every election. So northern Ohio is, uh, is much more liberal and much more likely Democratic. Southern Ohio, particularly Cincinnati, is probably one of the reddest places on earth. And in the middle of the state is the middle of the two points of view. So I grew up in an environment where you had leadership and the benefactors of the town that were more likely to sponsor your prom, your baseball team, your whatever, uh, came from Harvard or some northeastern school and came down and they had their MBAs and they ran these plants. Maybe didn't relate to the workers very well, but they had developed points of view about how the world ought to work. And then you had the other side, which was, um, you know, if it wasn't for the union and if it wasn't for the Mead, we wouldn't have a job. And so you, you had very different points of view. So oftentimes you'd have these great debates, even when you're in the second grade, about the way the world ought to look. <laughs> and, and what you really learned was they were very polarizing. And so you learned a, a good portion of us that came from there learned to be really good centrist and problem solvers because what we realized pretty early was either really, really strong point of view was never the whole story and probably didn't have the whole solution. So it was really an interesting environment to grow up in. Um, the, um, we were, I'd call it middle class for that town, but once I moved from there, I realized we were lower middle. We had a house that had, you know, no garage. We had no air conditioning. We had, you know, we didn't have that much. Went to a school that didn't have air conditioning, but it was a private school. I went to a Catholic grade school that my mom and dad scraped to, to pay for because they thought that was important. And much like Lacia's story, were it not for a stronger educational background, I'm not sure that I would be where I am today. Now, unlike Lacia, I'm the only member of my family that did not graduate from college. So, you know, my story is a little different. I don't recommend it. I think it was, <laughs> I think it was a big mistake, an error in judgment when I was younger. But I followed an entrepreneur who meant a lot to me and had every intention of finishing later, and that just never too inconvenient as you start to ascend. It came up in the resume, in the review process when we were interviewing John. Yeah, oh, I'm sure it did. <laughs> I can only imagine the, the barriers that must create. Much no different than when I'm evaluating talent. It, it's, it's one of those gates that we tend to use as an automatic. And so it's very difficult and very rare. And again, I, I wouldn't recommend it. So I'm a statistical anomaly in a very different sort of way uh, than Lacey is. But, but, uh, but uh, and I, I also, I, would, I don't recommend that kind of tent. It's hard to create those circumstances again in America, but there are a lot of people out of Chillicothe that have gone on to lead enterprises. So there's quite a list of, of, of folks out there because I, I think of the, the stress of the environment creates maybe a level four that we talked about next door and maybe a, in a few cases level five, a different kind of maturity that comes with or without education. Um, mom and dad were big mentors. They were very principled people. Dad was working class, worked for the power company. Uh, his brother, um, you know, climbed poles. My dad went into management because he was a little bit afraid of heights. And uh, that came from, he was served in the Korean War and he was a paratrooper and he jumped out of planes so much he didn't want to climb a pole. He just, after about 15 feet off the ground, he'd get the heebie-jeebies and I guess a couple of those parachutes that barely opened. Um, uh, got to him eventually. So he, he, he went into management. But, our, but the bias in our family, because it was the bias of the town and the bias of your peers and your friends would be, don't go into management. Now you're the devil. So it was just one of those kind of towns. And, um, and so it was, it was very interesting to kind of try to navigate both sides of it, uh, even, even there, even as a youngster. So. Great. Thank you, John. Was there a certain pivot point in your career that you just point to and say, boy, if that wouldn't happen, I wouldn't have gotten to where I was. Yeah, a big pivot point, point for me. We moved to Oklahoma. The, 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 dad, the company, Clemens and Southern Ohio Electric, was bought by Consolidated Edison. And so they told dad, you know, this office is going away. You go to Tampa and take a pay cut, or you can go to New Jersey and you keep your current job. But then that current job, the money wouldn't go as far. So he didn't think it was a good idea for the family. So he went out west to start looking for a job. He was offered a position in Colorado, but on the way there, he stopped in Tulsa, read the newspaper about a position that was available, and he took a weekend interview, and on a way to a job in Colorado, 
took another job instead. So we wound up in Oklahoma in the middle of high school. And so I, I was not a big man on campus, but I was kind of somebody in my small town, started both ways on the football team, and I thought I was a real athlete. And then I went to Tulsa, where the <laughs> football programs are extremely well developed, and sat on the bench. And so I kind of developed a little bit of an inferiority complex coming through that era in my life. You go to Oklahoma, it's very different. Uh, people wear, I wore Levi's and blousy Paisley shirts with Elton John stack shoes and no pockets in the front. You know, the girls didn't wear makeup. You know, it was all about education in Chillicothe, Ohio. And in Tulsa, there's big hair and makeup and <laughs> wranglers and boots and skull. And it was just a culture shock for a high school kid. So. <laughs> So, so I went to work for Bill Wall. Bill Wall um, was the founder of Taco Bueno, and I started with him in high school as a kid and, and went to work for him. And then he started building these Taco Bueno restaurants. So I went off to college, and then he called and said, uh, based on the track record when I worked for him at Casa Bonita, he said, why don't you come help me open restaurants? So I went with him to Oklahoma City to open up that market for him. I was 19 years old. And his promise was he'd send me back to school once we got the Oklahoma City market up and running. So here I am, 19. I'll try to make this as short as I can. But I'm 19. We open up a restaurant. I'm sold out on making this company go because I really believe in the founder and his values. And this is a colossal failure. So we're, we're not doing any business. All the other stores are rocking. <clears throat> this store, I'm, I've moved, dropped out of school, and now I'm in Oklahoma City. I don't know anybody in this Restaurant's not working. So we're right next door to this little old folks home. And every day these little old ladies would get a, like a kitchen pass to leave and they'd come over and eat. And because we built such a pretty restaurant, they thought it was a full service restaurant. It was really a fast food restaurant. So you could just see them. They'd be walking down the aisle. They'd look at the menu board and they don't see servers. So they'll turn around and they'll go to leave. And we needed the business. So I have this 28-year-old manager, Byron Brown, and a 19-year-old that clearly wasn't qualified to run this business. So he runs out and taps these little old ladies on the shoulder, and he goes, you know, young lady, you know. That, well, first of all, this is a, an old lady and her mother, who was much even older, I mean, barely walking. <laughs> and so she ta he taps them on the shoulder and says, young ladies, why don't you sit down and I'll take your order. And he looks after them, and they stay, and we get a little five bucks out of them, right? And uh, we might survive another day. I mean, we were really going broke there. And so then he leaves to go home, and he's going to come back later that night, and two more little old ladies come in. And so, you know, I'm acting outside of myself, trying to be Byron all of a sudden. These ladies come. They turn around to leave. I run out there and tried to pull his move. I topped him on the shoulder. I go, young ladies, you know, <laughs> and they were offended. And this woman, <laughs> this, this woman, she starts cussing a blue streak. I mean, the last thing you'd think would come out a little old lady. She smelled like vodka. I mean, she, so I mean, I go, how did she sneak her bottle since she left the place next door? But they were not very kind at all. They stormed out. And that life lesson was so pivotal because at a very young age, and you kind of wish this on everybody, you kind of learn you're here to delight others, to serve others, to do something meaningful for others, for something bigger than yourself. And at that very moment, I go, I'm trying hard. My feet hurt. I smell like a fry later when I go home. I, I'm, I'm pouring my heart into this. Life's not working out. I should have never dropped out of school. And we're not, I can't even delight two little old women. I can't even figure out how to serve customers. So <laughs> in my mind, it was the world was coming to an end. And then a few minutes later, in came this deaf man that came in literally every day when his shift was over. He was a shift worker nearby. Uh, he couldn't talk. He, he could speak, but not very well because he was deaf and obviously couldn't hear himself. And uh, so he would use sign language or write a note. And we already knew we wanted. He ordered the same thing every day. So we made his food and had it ready before he got his change practically, but he'd already turned down to seat himself. So in a fast food environment, I just ran around the counter and went over and handed him his food and said, it's ready. So he almost in a, you know how the deaf express themselves more, uh, I don't know, with more facial expression. So he, he made the sign, that's fast, and lipped the words. And I literally could feel, you know, my buttons popping off my shirt like, like I'd really satisfied this customer, right? So what went through my mind in those two little teachable moments is that's what it's all about. And ever since then, I thought, you know, I know what Bill Wall, the founder, is trying to do. 
I know what we're trying to do. This unit may not make it, but this brand will be fine. And then, you know, we went and built 180 restaurants together. I did take some courses, never finished, but, <laughs> but I still, to, him, to this day, believe that principal life lessons, young, um, going through some tough spots uh, are healthy things, and that was pivotal for yeah, me. That's a pretty good pivot point. Thank you, John. Alicia, how about you? There's been so many. Um, it's hard to pick just one, and I think for me there have been a series of transitions that were really important, and I'll try to knit a few together pretty quickly. But the first one started um, shifting from Chicago to Minneapolis. And it may seem like a little thing because we often tell people, you know, go where there's a great opportunity. And I'd already moved from, you know, rural Indiana, a town of 700 to Chicago, almost 10 million. Clearly I'd made that leap. But somehow transitioning from Chicago, which was an amazing experience for me, both professionally and personally, and, and vibrant and diverse and so much energy. It, when I had an opportunity to be, to be promoted, by the way, and moved to Minneapolis where Target was headquartered, I thought it was the end of the world. And I really didn't want to move. I was also in graduate school. I was working full time and going to graduate school in the evenings part time. And I felt like my life was there. And yet there was an amazing opportunity for me to unite three different business units, um, corporate contributions programs into one. And I was the youngest of my three peers and was going to be promoted to lead them into creating a new strategy and structure. And so it was a, an amazing opportunity. I thought, okay, I'm going to graduate school in essence to get the job they've just offered me. I should probably do it, right? Uh, and so I made that leap. Uh, made that leap to move to Minneapolis and I was incredibly um, scared, uh, I, if I was being honest, and scared because one, I wanted to finish the graduate school program. I, again, was the first to graduate from um, college, wanted to also go on and complete a graduate school degree, and quite frankly, I didn't think I knew what the hell I was doing and probably may not have been, in my mind, the most qualified, although later they said I was clearly the most entrepreneurial, uh, took a lot of risks, and um, was good at figuring things out. And so I leapt and made that move. And so the ability to move into a space where there was lots of unknown, where perhaps you even have some self-doubt, um, is, was a really important pivot point for me. And to leave what was, for me, comfortable to become very uncomfortable was an incredible um, life lesson and a great professional <coughs> lesson. And, and so I fast forward to so many opportunities that have come since where I was perhaps a little too comfortable and needed to get uncomfortable to really have the next breakthrough opportunity to drive shareholder value, to drive not only professional growth, but personal growth. And a great example of that was a few years later after I'd moved to the Twin Cities, um, my boss uh, at the time had a personal emergency and um, decided that she was going to step down and I was in charge. And one of my mentors at the time was Mrs. Coretta Scott King, who was Dr. the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s wife. And she just looked at me and she said, you know what? You have earned the right to be here. If you hadn't earned the right to be here, you wouldn't have been given this opportunity. So do what you've been called upon to do. And I'll never forget it. It was so sobering for me. And I was just staring at her. <laughs> I said, got it. And so each pivot that comes when maybe I don't always feel like I'm quite ready, I remember those words, of whether that was being promoted onto the you know, executive committee of Target. Um, and I'm still the only person of color on that executive committee today, having the opportunity to join a Fortune um, Thousand board where, you know, again, there's so few people of color on boards today, as we all know. That, you know, that was a wonderful opportunity. And quite frankly, I'm in a position, Chief Corporate Social Responsibility Officer, there aren't a lot of companies looking for people with my background for their board. So you could spend a lot of time um, second guessing why you are qualified to do, but, you know, I don't do that anymore. You know, I've earned the right to be here. I work hard. I have contributions to make. I want a seat at the table. I've earned it. Uh, and I think. So many of us have heard, as we heard yesterday, if you were here, and I say this often, uh, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're often on the menu. And I don't want to be on the menu, right? You know, the topic is about a look into the boardroom, but it's always so important to really pull the personal dynamic and perspective of people because we're all very alike. And so it's really important for you all to share those stories. And so 
first of all, thank you for sharing the, the personal insights before we get into some of the meat. So, John stepped into a situation at Denny's where they've they'd had a, you know a lot of issues. Uh, but I just would love to hear a little bit about the uh, the road and, and a little bit about Denny's business today. Sure, Denny's has an interesting history. It's it was born in the coffee shop space. Uh, it was born actually all the way back in 1953, so whatever year, 50, 62 years old this year. And it, it's a stalwart positioning in the restaurant business to give you some idea. The, those of us in the business think about occasions. Um, we, we tend to think about the different space and what our space does. So, and we divide the industry by check. So there's QSR, which averages about 6 to $7 a head. Uh, I know you want it to average about 550 according to surveys, but it's actually about a dollar more than that. And then there's family dining, which is where Denny's is positioned. And family dining is about $9 per person all day. Um, we, are, we are a category that usually doesn't have a bar, but there are exceptions. It's a category that's designed to serve more than one generation, families out with kids. And that could be me, my ch I'm the child of my mother. So it doesn't matter the age so much as it's more than one generation is usually when we become into the, the uh, consideration set. Uh, we fed most of America's full service meals through the 60s until about 75 or 80. And then about uh, between 75 and 80, there was a big sea change in America where our space started to get really tired. Lunch rooms, lay in white ceilings, formica tables, and the texture of America was changing with places like steak and ale or Binnigan's or Chili's or Friday's or Applebee's and things that became a little bit more neighborhood oriented. It used to be you could just go to the urban places, adult gathering places, business, business account meals. And so our category started to go from the most prominent to diminished. And during that time, from the mid 70s all the way to about 2001, our space went into some decline in check average and transactions uh, Sunday through Thursday, gave it over to Chili's and others, and we grew transactions on the weekends and when you're on vacation. In other words, out with the family when you weren't using a bar. Now that bars are available in your neighborhood and the stigma of a, a bar that was for pickup reasons went away and it was just a neighborhood. It wasn't a bar, but a grill and bar, not not, not, not bar and grill, so sort of the opposite. So when those became prominent in the neighborhoods, the family dining space was really diminished. And so, uh, but, but it was made up by stronger breakfast sales, the things that the other guys didn't do. So we were redefined instead of the places families went out to eat as the place you went out for breakfast all day, which lowered our check but kept high value. Well, the, because of that, we lost the, the upper crust clientele and it tended to be those that didn't have other options. We, came, we, be, we became the places, Waffle House, IHOP, or back then International House of Pancakes, Perkins, Denny's, Bob Evans, Frisch's, as the place that fed poor families. And uh, what's happened to our space is that the food's good at breakfast, but the rest of the food's not very good. So if you get a burger, you think about anybody but us. You think of our space as a frozen patty that's not very good and wouldn't compete. If you think of mom's cooking, which is what built our industry, you get a pot roast at home or a higher end diner in New York somewhere, but you wouldn't get it at Denny's or IHOP. It wouldn't be very good. Get omelets and pancakes there. So the ability to become mom's cooking, not grill and bar, to have our own unique space in the marketplace was what customers were expecting from us. They also expected a texture change. They wanted a nicer environment, but still an unpretentious environment. And they want to park their title. So whether you're rich, or poor, you want to basically just become you. So a diner is for Warren Buffett as much as it is for the people that have low means, right? So it's, it's about that place where you can just be yourself. And so the extent that we can create that view of our brand and that emotional connection with our consumers, um, then we can come some distance. One challenge, uh, we had certainly in a past life, some better than 20 years ago, uh, alienated a certain very important part of our population. And so, you know, we felt like it was very important to do something about that. So even though I don't like the words business case when it comes to right thing to do type conversations, if you want a business case for diversity and inclusion, look at Denny's. Mm -hmm. When we turned and faced our issues some four or five years ago, under the leadership of Laisha and Brenda and George and our very diverse board, 43% diverse come May, 
um, 33 percent women, and a bias toward not only giving management cover to face the hard issues, but also, I'd say, mandates. Yes, really, you could say kind that. mandates. <laughs> With, with that kind of leadership, we've been able to turn and face our issues, and this brand who lost transactions for 19 consecutive years in a row is now positive in its fifth consecutive year in a row. So if you want a business case, there it is right there. Thank you, John. So the last two years, two years in a row, 47.8%, 40, I'm sorry, 43.8%, Two years ago, last year, 43.9% of all hires at Denny's were minority hires. So, Two years in a row. That speaks a lot to, uh, to John's style of leadership. He is a very strong servant leader. He's involved with so many things. Uh, uh, in particular uh, is about feeding very hungry kids. And we could talk about that one later because I think that's a very special calling that but you if, have. But if I could add on to that, one of the reasons that we've made progress is because, again, we face the issue. And so I think what's really important both for the CEO but also for a board, so as we talk about the role of management and as the board, it's to provide guidance and direction and to set expectations that will help deliver shareholder value. And it was very clear for our board that we thought diversity and inclusion was going to ensure that we delivered shareholder value. And it was something then that we put into our strategic plan. It's something that we talk about at the board level, at committees, um, that we you know, literally talk about at every meeting. So that it is you know, not just you know, a, a nice to do, but something that is a part of our business imperative. And so I would just share that these things don't happen by accident. Um, they happen by being intentional and they happen by having often uncomfortable conversations about the progress that you're making or the lack thereof. And I think we have that kind of healthy debate um, at the board level and with management and certainly uh, with John so that uh, we're able to celebrate where we are making progress but are very, very clear when we don't feel like we're uh, moving the needle or moving the needle fast enough and put then in place plans to ensure that we're living up to the values and expectations that we have of this brand and quite frankly that the shifting demographics in this country which make up our consumers demand as well. How has life changed as a board member now that John's on board? Can you talk about those kinds of things? Certainly. It, it, something John and I share in common, when uh, I was first approached to consider the Denny's board, I was like, eh, I'll pass. Um, and again, it's not as though there were like lots of board requests coming my way. I just wasn't sure that given the, the halo of a brand like Target, where I worked and represented, that Denny's was going to be the place for me. But like John, did a lot of research, um, met a lot of the other board members, um, including meeting uh, the franchise part of the business, which is something I think we should come back to because yes. it really is a significant component of our business model and where there is a significant amount of diversity and inclusion um, that we're able to bring to life in local communities around the country. Um, I too was intrigued by the challenge and was intrigued by uh, the ability to take a brand that also had had issues in the diversity and inclusion space and be a part of the solution. And so it's within that context that uh, I decided to join the board, um, although I must say a month after I joined the board, there was a proxy battle. And that was not what I was expecting. <laughs> that wasn't in my research plan. And so if you've ever been either involved in or read about proxies, it is an all-consuming battle for the life of the company. Uh, and in fact, in essence, I thought, boy, before I even really spend a full, you know, six months on this board, I will in essence be kicked off if the activist shareholder wins. It was really an interesting opportunity to onboard and to bond uh, with my peer group. And in many ways, I think really, um, you know, you turn a crisis into an opportunity. It allowed me to, in a very short period of time, understand the business, the opportunities, the challenges, uh, to really understand and connect with um, the rest of the board. And I was probably, I'm probably at least 15, 20 years younger than most of the board, and so it allowed me to sort of close that gap around age and experience because it was all in to win, and we were all very committed to making sure that we protected uh, and ultimately enhanced that brand. I would say um, with John, uh, in interviewing him, what I found uh, was someone clearly who has done his homework. He understood the restaurant industry uh, at a very, very deep level and all the different segments of the restaurant industry. Um, there was no question that he um, uh, wouldn't take and address directly. And so I really appreciated um, the boldness and transparency at which he approached all issues, which uh, gave me um, 
a lot of confidence that he would be able to partner with us to turn the business around, including making diversity and inclusion an important component of our success story. And ultimately, I would suggest that that has been one of the components of our secret sauce. So being a board member has made you more effective uh, um, executive at oh, your yeah. own company. Absolutely. And has it changed the way that your executive team looks at you? I would say yes. It's interesting because you, you get different tips and tricks. I mean, you know, that, that, one of the things that's great about Denny's as I was onboarding is the opportunity to go to all of the committee meetings, and so I took advantage of that. So whether it was the comp committee, uh, the, gov you know, the governance committee that I'm a part of, uh, audit, there, there was an openness to ensuring that we all learn the business in a very meaningful way. And so I would sit in on all the other committee meetings just as a way to build my business acumen and to also make connections with different parts of the management team and different parts of the board. And again, we also transitioned out one CEO and hired in another. I mean, I've, you pick up on a few things um, that I then have been able to translate back uh, to target. And what's also interesting, I think an important lesson, the size of these two companies is very different, obviously. Um, and yet there are learnings that can go both ways. You assume often that the largest uh, entity has the most uh, information uh, to share and transfer knowledge around, and I would say that's not always the case. There's, yeah. there's learning and sharing that happens both ways, and um, you know, certainly that's been an important component for me to bring to the table. But on the governance side, it's a good reminder there is a role for the board, and then there is a role for the management team. Yeah. And when we transitioned out the CEO prior to John coming in, that did get flipped on its head because we had an interim CEO. Um, he mentioned um, Deborah, uh, who was our lead director. She became the interim CEO. Uh, we were also down uh, a member of our executive team at Denny's. Uh, we were hiring a new CMO. Uh, we, we, we were transitioning the COO. There was a tremendous amount of change and transformation happening in that brand, and so it did require mm -hmm. Um, that we spend a lot more time engaging with the management team and helping to run the business by the very nature of those other um, senior management transitions that were occurring. And on the hills of just winning a proxy battle, you're not safe. You know, ultimately, there are still activists that are monitoring uh, what you're doing and, and, and shareholder value and the like. And so it did require a, a very different level of engagement that you then have to ensure you're able to pivot away from. And so back to governance, you could start to do those things and then never want to give up that power and control. Sure. And so we had to ensure that we had the right kind of conversations once we hired okay. the CEO. But I've had some experiences before I was ever on a board. Um, I, you know, I mentioned earlier that I work for this small brand called Taco Bueno. And when, it, when the founder sold it, this back in the middle 80s, um, to this British outfit, so we had, I wasn't on the board, but I sort of attended, now I'm attending board meetings because the founder's gone, so somebody's got to represent our brand. And, and these folks would come through and they'd tour the restaurants, and, and I just remember tr that the, how alien, how foreign the language was. So uh, one tour, this person's now in charge of my destiny and the brand's destiny, therefore. I uh, had read an article about how casual dining, places like Chili's and all those places were really ascending and we were a fast food chain. So even though we were growing and printing cash and had really extraordinary returns, they had decided to shut down growth of the fast food division because of an article they read in Restaurant News. So this is the sort of, you're subject to this, these views that, that can really disrupt an organization uh, rather than on the merit of the business itself. Um, so w one of these tours we're going through Dallas, Fort Worth, touring restaurants, and this guy obviously doesn't know anything about Mexican food. He, he looks up at the menu, and we had uh, crispy tacos, right? fried corn shells, and then we had the flour. And uh, it's all in English, but uh, and this person's British. So he looks up at the menu, and he goes, what is soft beef? And I go, soft beef? The description of soft beef taco meaning a flour tortilla instead of crispy. So and I go, okay, there's no such thing as soft beef. But, but this, so every board meeting, the first two hours were just explaining the obvious if you grew up in, the, in America serving food. And, and, then, and then, so what we have at Denny's is an extraordinary board of astute business people that have, you know, you know we're very, our, the executive management team at Denny's is very spoiled in how this board was assembled as stars of the industry. Uh, and I say that not because Lacey's sitting here to make myself look good with my boss, but it's just, it's a fact. I mean, there's not very many people that do anywhere in the world what Lacia does. 
So if there's an example of what she does, she is the top of that example. There, there is, she is the prototype of corporate social responsibility in the world. And, and if you go look at, um, you know, bond traders, <laughs> Uh, George Haywood from Washington, D.C., nobody knows more than this man. Mm -hmm. He's the brightest human being I've ever met. Uh, and he serves as second on our finance committee. Mm -hmm. so, so this is not a rhetorical or build diversity, gosh, hope you find somebody. This is the first rule of business is you're going to get stars to run this enterprise, and they're going to represent diversity and inclusion. So th this is about... I think a model way to do it. We have an extraordinary group of human beings that just know what's wrong and right with the questions and how to guide a management team. When I think about Denny's right now, I think about, you know, what do you want to make sure endures when you're done? And, and one of the things I want to do is be able to create this, this industry-wide model for what boards should look like, what governance should look like, what diversity and inclusion should look like. And I think the fact that we still get so much of it wrong, uh, we win awards for diversity and inclusion, I think we're horrible. I think we have areas in our business that are way underrepresented. I don't think there's relatability across all of our leadership positions. And so that has to be addressed if we really mean we care about these things. And so if I'm not going to do it, then who will do it? The next person? So it has to happen now. And so you have to set hard targets. You have to lead differently than the way we've led in the past. I'll give you an example. Diversity and inclusion things entered the full service arena about 91, 92. My wife and I established the first program at Brinker years and years ago. It was successful for a season, and it kind of mm -hmm. ran out of gas. So I look around now, full service today. Now, fast food has a better track record. Retail's got a horrible track record, but some companies are extraordinary, and they should be acknowledged in the marketplace. But Denny's, while it's 43% diverse and minority and 33% and women, Full service and fast casual brands, those 200 brands you've ever heard of, without it, has a 7% diverse board in our, in our industry. So not only do I want Denny's to have a great record to lead from strength, but to influence others in the industry to do better. So we're going to start pushing our weight around a little bit in the CEO circles and calling attention to it. We're trying to create a National Restaurant Association acknowledgement for who's got it right. Because I think when, when, you, when, you, when you start to win awards, then you have a voice, and when you, if you don't use that voice, then you really didn't care about the subject. So I, I think a good, a good leadership team is transparent and accountable. And, um, and in the last four years of my service at Denny's, we've done some good things, but there are some areas that are not where they should be. And so while I'm disappointed they aren't further along by now, to pretend it's different or to put some lipstick on it is the wrong way to think about it. The right thing to do is turn and face it, show the world what the truth is, and then go do better next year. And so, I think that's... But, but I think also the things where, where we've done better than likely people realize the franchise base. So I mentioned that earlier. Denny's is over 91% franchise, if you're not aware of that. So it's a franchise model versus a company-owned model, which it's transitioned to over the years. And our franchisee base is about 46% diverse. And so uh, what's compelling about that to me is that is, in essence, local business owners, right? So when you think about an economic engine, that's a really important part of our diversity and inclusion story, making sure that we have a very diverse, diverse and successful franchisee base, uh, but also making sure then that our, what I'd call headquarters market is equally diverse, particularly at the management ranks. And so we really do slice and dice this from supplier diversity to how we engage in the communities, the products and services, who's our consumer base, and we're able then to ascertain where, again, we're making progress and then where we've got some room to grow. And to be candid, we think we've got some room to grow um, at the management levels in our uh, headquarters market. And so, again, we're facing it and coming up with solutions. Can I just ask you to close with just one piece of advice to everybody here related to boards or the future of Latinos in the boardroom? <clears throat> if your board isn't relatable and representative to the marketplace, you're going to be in big trouble in a few years. So that my advice is get your act together. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say a very similar advice. Um, back to what Mrs. King told me, we've earned the right to be here, right? Uh, and it is a business imperative. And if you want to win in the marketplace, you need to ensure that all aspects of your business represent the marketplace that you're serving. And with the growth in the demographics, of this country, uh, with Latino population growing, it you know it's 
uh, an imperative. Uh, it's a must do. Um, and, and, if, and if you aren't getting the traction, uh, I would just encourage you to be more bold um, and get people more comfortable being uncomfortable talking about the issue. So often, I think, uh, as people of color, we don't want to be the one that has to bring up the issue. You hope that others will bring it up. But I um, would suggest that um, if not us, then who? Uh, and we have to ensure that we are courageous enough to ensure that these issues are discussed and discussed in a way that um, are in the context of growing and driving the business. Right? This isn't charity. This isn't a moral imperative. This is a business imperative. And if you want to win, this is what you need to do. Uh, and if you wait for somebody else to say it and they don't say it, then that is an opportunity lost and we can't afford to have those opportunities lost. So I've just encouraged you to be bold and courageous and ensure that we don't look back and wonder why we didn't get what our communities deserve. Um, you hope that people will see the benefit, but if they don't, it's, it's incumbent upon us to ensure that we do everything within our power uh, and our sphere of influence to make it happen. Please, uh, let's thank our panelists.